Welcome back to the Orthodox Universalist channel. In this video, we're going to dig into more biblical evidence for Christian Universalism. Let's get started. So how many of you guys are interested in art? It could be painting or sketching, charcoal, or maybe you just enjoy visiting museums or looking at art, going to galleries maybe. I was fairly interested in art when I was younger, but my interest sort of waned for a while and really didn't resurface until a few years ago. Two of my favorite artists today are Albert Durer and Gustave Doré. Durer was born in the 15th century and enjoyed a surprising amount of fame for a time when the mass production and distribution of art was quite a challenge in comparison to today. Doré lived in the 19th century and is partly remembered for the sheer volume of art that he produced in his life. Dying at the age of only 50, he still managed to create over 100,000 sketches. That's almost six sketches a day, or actually more than that. Durer's work depicts a number of well-known stories, such as St. George and the Dragon, along with images that have a medieval or biblical theme. Doré, on the other hand, also illustrated several well-known stories, such as The Ancient Mariner or Dante's Inferno. But my favorite sketches of his are definitely those steeped in symbolism of Christianity or the Bible. One that I always remember is his illustration of the Valley of Dry Bones, where Ezekiel is carried away by God in the spirit to a valley filled with the long dead corpses of a great host. We read about this in Ezekiel chapter 37. There we read, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come, from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. The scene here is pretty extreme. God goes beyond mere language and actually gives Ezekiel this morbid vision concerning the people of Israel. Leading Ezekiel among the dead, God asks, Can these bones live? I don't know about you guys, but there have been times in my life, and there's still a lot of times today, when I feel pretty dead spiritually. There's something in me that's drawn to doing the right thing, 
but that something often seems like a spark under an anvil. Often, I don't even know how to begin doing what's right, or sometimes even how to want to. In such times, I feel about as useful to God as one of those dry skeletons in the valley of dry bones. I know I have nothing to offer, and I'm tempted to question what God thinks of a guy like me. In this video, I want to try to answer the question we've probably all had at some point. Will God ever give up on a person completely? When over and over again we find ourselves struggling under the weight of our doubt, our complacency, our weakness, our sins, is there ever a point when God says, all right, that's enough. I've got no more mercy, no more hope, no more help to give you. For better or worse, if we embrace the conventional view of eternal conscious torment, the answer to this question is, unfortunately, yes. I mean, how many of us have sat through sermons or listened to podcasts where we've heard a pastor quote Hebrews 9.27 saying, It's appointed for man once to die, and after that, face judgment. But not only does this text not mean exactly what these teachers make it out to mean, but it's also just their way of dressing up a message that they believe but might not want to say plainly, which is, one day God is going to give up on you, so you better get right with him before he does. Now, I want to be fair here. Those who would affirm the above statement have more biblical fuel for their argument than simply Hebrews 9.27. Romans chapter 1, for example, shows in definite terms how, if we walk away from God, God will give us over to deeper and deeper forms of depravity. Simply put, to a certain extent, God will give us exactly what we ask for. If we want to take the road that seems to lead further and further away from Him, and further and further from the light, He'll let us do just that. And yet, we encounter clear evidence in Scripture that even in our disobedience, God keeps restoration in view. The hope and the expectation of God is that if we will persist in sin, the destruction that we will meet in it will serve as a potent enough form of evangelism to draw us back towards the light. Consider the following. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1-5, through 5, we see a glimpse of church discipline, but also of the purpose of the destruction that that discipline might result in that the early Christians always kept in view. We read, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in the body, I am present in the spirit. As if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved. In the day of our Lord. The action that Paul requires of the Corinthian church in this text is sobering and should be taken seriously, but we have to recognize that the point of the action is still in view. The whole point was that in handing the man over to destruction, the church was seeking that his spirit may be saved. So the idea wasn't that the church was to give up on the man but that through delivering him to the ends of his own sin, they might play their part in seeking his restoration. To give this man over was, for the Corinthians, to give him his best chance. Romans 11, 25-32 demonstrates a similar point. We read, A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, The Deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. 
For the gifts of the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient, in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. So speaking of both Jews and Gentiles here, Paul makes plain to us the purpose that God maintains when he gives them over to their disobedience, and that purpose is mercy. So when God lets us walk away, is he giving up on us? Absolutely not. He's doing the exact opposite. He allows our disobedience and uses it in our lives as a means to reconcile us to his goodness. Yet we can say even more than this. For not only does God use our disobedient wanderings to reconcile us to his mercy, rather even when we deliberately are caused grief or when he afflicts us in our sins, he takes no pleasure in such discipline, but looks forward to the moment when such measures can be lifted. Consider the narrative we find in Lamentations chapter 3. The prophet Jeremiah, after having described the destruction of Israel and the sins that prompted that destruction, describes his personal experience under the weight of the wrath of God. In verses 1 through 6, Jeremiah says, I am the man who has seen affliction. Under the rod of his wrath, he has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. So according to Jeremiah, God drove him into darkness turned his hand against him, made his flesh waste away, broke his bones, besieged him with bitterness, and so on. Dark stuff. Yet through all of this, Jeremiah keeps the overarching character of God in mind. Consider verses 21 through 24 and 31 through 33. But this, he says, I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. For Jeremiah, even when the whole world is falling apart, even when he's experienced and written down every bad thing that we could probably even think of, one thing remains true through it all. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. And who does scripture tell us God loves? Well, he loves the whole world. As discussed on this channel in the video on predestination, God's benevolence is aimed at reconciling everyone, without exception, to himself. Thus, if his love never ceases, and he loves all people, what conclusions should we draw? What hope should we harbor for this life and for the next? I think the answer is obvious, but let's let Jeremiah answer the question by rereading verses 31 through 32. Again, he says, The Lord will not cast off forever, but though he causes grief, he will have compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. No matter how you translate the word forever here, the emphasis of the text is conclusive. The griefs and afflictions that we face from God are always limited and exercised always with their end in mind. No matter what we're facing, even if we're experiencing the depths of the consequences of our sins, we can rest in the assurance that God will have compassion. But how far will this compassion extend? 
Might it even extend beyond the grave? I think there's conclusive reasons to believe that the answer is yes. Consider what we learn about the extent of Christ's work in 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. Peter writes, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. I assume many of you have already made a study of this text, but for those who are new to it, let's break it down and talk about why it's so important. First, we see the rebellious spirits of a former age, and the antediluvian age in particular, locked in a post-mortem prison. To put it plainly, we see those who were unrepentant in life facing the consequence for their unrighteousness after death. Then, we are told that Christ went and proclaimed to these spirits in prison. So those who were punished in life and were actively experiencing the imprisonment after death due to their former lives of sin were not forgotten by Christ, but visited by him in their affliction. Now, I've heard people argue that Christ didn't descend into this prison of the afterlife to lead its inhabitants to repentance. Some have argued that Christ simply went to proclaim his victory to these rebels, like a king bragging about his decisive victory over his enemies. But this interpretation does not line up with the testimony of the early church or with the context itself. First, let's consider what the church fathers had to say. According to them, why did Christ visit these spirits in prison? The Cambridge Bible for Schools and Colleges makes it clear that Christ descended into Hades, or hell if you like, to deliver those who were trapped there. Consider their overview. This view of post-mortem deliverance finds a confirmation in the teaching of some of the earliest fathers of the church, in Clement of Alexandria, and Origen, and Athanasius, and Cyril of Alexandria, even Augustine at one time held that the effect of Christ's descent into Hades had been to set free some who were condemned to the torments of hell, and Jerome adopted this interpretation without any hesitation. Its acceptance at an early date is attested by the apocryphal gospel of Nicodemus, nearly the whole of which is given to the narrative of the triumph of Christ over Hades and death, who were personified as the potentates of darkness. It tells how he delivered Adam from the penalty of his sin and brought the patriarchs from a lower to a higher blessedness and emptied the prison house and set the captives free and erected the cross in the midst of Hades that there also it might preach salvation. As a matter of history, the article, He Descended Into Hell, i.e. into Hades, first appeared in the Apostles' Creed, at a time when the tradition was almost universally accepted, and when the words of the Creed could not fail to be associated in men's minds with the hope which it embodied. So many of the most prominent early church fathers believed that Christ descended into hell to empty the prison house. And this would have been the very thing that the early church had in mind when they included a confession of Christ's descent into hell in the Apostles' Creed. Now, it needs to be admitted that this hasn't been the exclusive view of the church. Arrhenius, Hippolytus, Tertullian, and a few of the reformers believed that Christ descended into the prison to deliver only the righteous. But we need to recognize that, as can be seen from the overview provided from the citation we have just read, this was the minority view. And when we reflect on the text, it's clear 
why the majority believe that Christ descended into hell to deliver sinners. Verse 20, for example, plainly states that Christ descended to minister specifically to a group now imprisoned that was disobedient in life. And when Peter continues to drive his point home in 1 Peter 4, 5 through 6, the proposed outcome of Christ's preaching is revealed. Peter says that those who sin in this life will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the Spirit the way God does. When I think of the gospel being preached to the dead, I'm drawn back to the image we began with of Ezekiel walking with God in the Valley of Dry Bones. Emblematic of the destruction dealt to the nation of Israel for their sin, that field of death became for Ezekiel a vision of hope. He was given a glimpse of the destructive power of God, but also of the grace that would bring to life again those who have been destroyed. Divine justice will not be thwarted, but that justice is revealed, along with everything else, to find its ultimate satisfaction in a never-ending divine love, characterized by compassion. Now, if you're watching this video today, know that God will never give up on you. Does that mean he'll make life easy and prevent anything bad from ever happening to you or to those you love? No, it doesn't. But it does mean that he takes no pleasure in our pain and looks forward to the day when we and all creation will be completely freed from the bonds of sin and death that we have invited into creation. As Ezekiel tells us elsewhere, say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his way and live. And as we have seen in this study, whether now or later, on earth or in the prison of death, Christ will continue to reveal himself so that all people might turn to him and be saved. Thanks for hanging out with me as we discuss more biblical evidence for Christian universalism. I'm going to release one more video in this series, and then I want to explore the big questions of worldview and human agency from a Christian and a universalist perspective. There's so much more to talk about and so much more to discover, so I hope you stick around. As for right now, thanks for hanging out with me as we discuss more biblical evidence for Christian universalism. Like, subscribe, and even share the video if you liked it. And thanks for watching the Orthodox Universalist channel.